Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Sam Peck. I'm the Executive Director of Family Councils of Ontario. And as folks are coming in, um, it's just my pleasure to welcome you to today's session with our special guests from the Ministry of Long-Term Care, as they will be speaking on the update, updated guidance for long-term care homes. I can see by the number of folks who have joined us this morning that this will be a uh, popular uh, topic, uh, really important one to, to work through at this stage in the pandemic. So once again, for those who have just joined us, <clears throat> I'm Sam Peck, the Executive Director of Family Councils Ontario, and I'm welcoming you to today's session. Before we get into the content today, uh, we always take a moment to do a land acknowledgement. I know this is something that the ministry does as well for their sessions, but uh, as host, I'm going to share ours with you this morning. Uh, we acknowledge that Family Councils Ontario was founded on land, Toronto, that's the traditional territory of nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And like communities across Ontario, it's still home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. FCO is a remote team, and as part of our work across the province, we encourage our team members, our service users, and our partners to reflect on the enduring legacy of colonialism and engage in meaningful reconciliation. One first step is to learn more about the land that you're situated on. There's a great website that's uh, native-land.ca that you can learn uh, based on your address or your city about the territory, languages, and treaties uh, of the land you're on. I'm in Hamilton which is the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek and the Haudenosaunee. There is work that individual or uh, non-Indigenous organizations and individuals do uh, need to do towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. It's a long-term journey and it's going to be specific for each individual and it's ongoing for FCO. We don't have it all figured out either, but we are committed to uh, doing the work we need to do towards meaningful reconciliation. So on that note, um, I'm just gonna do a quick um, sort of logistics piece. Uh, the ministry folks will tell you how to submit your questions, uh, but in the meantime, for the chat, you'll be able to connect directly uh, with me. Please only use the chat for technical issues or any problems experiencing the webinar, as the Q&A will be done through a, a different means. Uh, but on this note, what we are going to do is I am going to turn it over to Don Mallet from the Ministry of Long-Term Care. Welcome, Don. Thank you so much, Sam, Sam, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, as Sam mentioned, we are uh, going to be facilitating a Q&A session at the uh, end of the presentation. For those who would like to submit questions, we will be doing this through a Slido, and you can go to the website www.sli.do or even just www.slido.com. Um, and in that participant, joining a participant um, area, you just enter the code FCOMAR16, uh, and that will bring you into the Q&A session. They will be moderated, as I mentioned, and so we will be focusing on questions related specifically to today's presentation, um, and our team um, will be um, uh, re reading all questions, though, if, if they are not related to today's uh, session itself. Also, there is a thumbs up uh, option where homes can go ahead, uh, or sorry, uh, family members can go ahead if they agree with a question and give it a big thumbs up and that will bring it up to the top of the list so that we are making sure that those most pressing, pressing questions are the ones that are, um, are, we are able to answer today. So once again, it's slido.com and the, uh, the entrance code is FCOMAR16. And we have this code on every one of our slides in case uh, you uh, can't remember and you, you need to join after uh, we've, we've moved on from this slide. Next slide, please. 
So last week, we um, had some changes that were announced uh, to the sector through a memo from Aaron Hanna, who is our Associate Deputy Minister here in the Ministry of Long-Term Care. And we really wanted to come here today to talk to everybody about that. Uh, one of the big questions is, is why the change now? And so this just really recognizes that we are seeing a good um, change in the numbers of cases and the number of, of outbreaks each week where we're seeing a lot of decreases. We um, reacted very quickly to the Omicron pandemic back in December. We had to put in a number of measures at that time with limited information even on the impact that Omicron would have um, on, on all Ontarians, but especially the residents of the, of the long-term care homes. And so we, uh, as we, we announced in early February, we're, we're bringing back those, those measures to bring a level of normalcy back into the home. Um, and we're also, we're not just seeing this throughout uh, the long-term care home sector. We're also seeing this throughout the, the province with the government easing measures across the, the province um, widespread. One thing to note, though, is the long-term care sector. We we just recognize that this is a um, the residents themselves are, are a more vulnerable sector. Many of them have a, um, a, um, health issues and everything, and so we're taking a little bit of a more measured approach in the long-term care sector. I also do just want to note that with this measured approach, we're trying to strike a balance um, and and recognize that. Um, everybody has a different lived experience throughout the pandemic, including including our residents. And there there's just differences in opinions as to whether we want, um, you know, people want to continue with measures and whether we're doing enough versus whether, you know, we should be erasing all the measures and just returning to things back to, to normal themselves. And so we are really trying to strike that balance and, and recognize that um, every individual might have a, a different opinion and just trying trying to make sure that we're, we're hitting on the points that make the most sense based on the current uh, public health uh, risk involved. And we work very closely with the Office of the Chief Medical Officer on Health on all of these uh, restrictions and measures in place to make sure that we're doing it with the most um, up-to-date uh, balance of um, the data that we have uh, going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So the changes that are taking place and started as of Monday for residents themselves is really um, encouraging the participation of social activities without staying in specific groups. And we've often referred to this as cohorting. Um, and so really trying to promote for homes to have different, um, uh, you know, people not have to stay in their unit per se, and so that they can go across units and across floors within the homes. And this really recognizes that residents um, have friends, and not just with people within their unit, but but with throughout the home it's, uh, itself. The one exception for this is dining. We are we are still requiring that the cohorting uh, in the the dining room continues uh, there. Also, the physical distancing from each other, um, recognizing that that really uh, puts operational pressures on the on the homes themselves, but it also impacts the residents themselves from having to physically distance from each other. So we are, uh, we have removed the requirement for physical distancing between the residents themselves. For the dining and the social activities, what, what we are uh, requiring is not the physical distancing in groups, but the physical distancing between groups. And so um, the dining room should have been set up like this for, for a while now where the tables, the people at the tables aren't physically distanced from each other, but the tables themselves are physically distanced. And so same with the social activity groups, uh, that there just be space between the, the different groups. We also have removed any limits on the number of uh, people in a group for social activities. And so it was 10 previously. We, we haven't put a number on it. And again, this just recognizes that each home is set up differently and even each uh, room within a home may be different. And so really looking forward um, and having homes set, you know, what makes sense for the space that they have available and trying to avoid crowding though, as um, uh, so while well, you don't need to be physically distanced, making sure that people do have a little bit of space between them. Um, and as well, a, a, an update for this uh, past week is that all residents now can go on all absences. So we previously um, had restrictions um, based on vaccination status for social day and, and overnight absences, and all of those uh, requirements have been lifted. 
uh, for people to go on absences now. Next slide, please. For, for visitors themselves, uh, we've increased the, the number of residents of, for visitors indoors at a time from three up to four. We've also, um, uh, with outdoor visitors uh, being more frequent with, as the weather becomes nicer, we're not putting a limit on the number of visitors that may come outdoors uh, for a visit. And we're really leaving that up to the home to decide. And this again, just recognizes that uh, each home um, is, is different with the outdoor space that they have available. Again, we're looking for physical distancing between groups. So what is operationally feasible? It's best known by the homes and, and we're leaving that decision up to them. Um, and uh, for residents themselves as well, physically distancing is not required um, for their visitors. And so back to what I was saying on the previous slide, uh, distancing between the groups, but not between the people themselves. And hopefully this uh, um, is, is a good update for everybody so that people can have, uh, be close to their loved ones when they do have visitors. And the final one on the slide is about visitors um, supporting residents in the dining room and joining activities. We are very supportive of that. The one caveat and flag here is regarding masking. Uh, mask re mask remain mandatory in all long-term care homes. And the mask um, should not be removed um, at any time within the home, unless you're in a designated space that the home has provided for visitors to eat or drink. And so if you're joining in the dining room, joining in activities, or even if you're just in the residence room, all visitors must remain masked at all times. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine, who will uh, speak to testing and vaccinations. Thank you, Don. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, for the time being, the surveillance testing requirements will continue to remain in place. Uh, so those current requirements include testing staff, caregivers, and visitors uh, that are coming into long-term care homes. Um, currently, the frequency for caregivers and for staff is at least two times per week if they're fully vaccinated. And uh, for those who are not fully vaccinated, for example, if they have a medical exemption, um, it's at least three times per week. Um, and visitors are tested prior to entry into the home. Um, so that will continue for the time being. We did make some uh, sort of more minor updates to the surveillance testing requirements based on the most recent advice from the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Uh, so one of those changes is to no longer test uh, people who are coming just for outdoor visits. Um, so, you know, what that means is now if you're coming to visit a, a loved one in a long-term care home, uh, you'll no longer have to be tested if that's just for an outdoor visit and that visit could begin uh, immediately and you wouldn't have to wait for your test result. Um, another change that we made is for those who have been previously infected with COVID-19, um, the testing would resume after 90 days of that confirmed infection. So as part of uh, one of the measures we took with Omicron, we did shorten that time period to 30 days because there was um, evidence earlier on around people getting reinfected with COVID-19 because of the Omicron variant. But now we're, we're at a, a point in the pandemic where we can um, put that back to the 90 day post-infection mark. Uh, so those are the changes to the surveillance testing. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of vaccination requirements, the, the vaccination program in long-term care homes has really been a great success. You know, thanks to you, thanks to your, your family members that live in long-term care homes, thanks to the caregivers and staff who all got vaccinated to not only protect yourself, but to also protect one another. Um, and that high vaccination rate in long-term care as well as across the province has really um, helped to mitigate the severity of out of outbreaks that we saw in long-term care homes and, and got us to the you know, downside of the Omicron wave. Um, in terms of vaccination rates, so virtually all staff working in long-term care and all residents are fully vaccinated with at least two doses. Uh, for staff, in terms of having a third dose, we know about 87% of eligible staff have received their third dose. And many, many residents have received their third doses and now their fourth doses to maximize their protection. Um, so at this stage in the pandemic, 
uh, the government is able to shift from the provincial directive uh, requiring uh, all homes to have a vaccination policy to a guidance-based approach uh, where that supports homes with their own policies. So with that, we, we did revoke the minister's directive as of Monday. And um, just for, for clarity, long-term care homes can continue to require proof of vaccination of staff or of caregivers or visitors, provided the home's requirements remain consistent with the Long-Term Care Homes Act, which includes the Residence Bill of Rights, and that they compl comply with all applicable laws. Um, and just a reminder that this shift does not change the importance of vaccination as a, as a key defense against COVID-19. And we continue to strongly encourage everyone to get vaccinated. And that includes receiving their boosters once eligible. So those are the changes to the, the vaccination directive. Next slide, please. Thank you. In terms of the supports that remain in place, so while we are uh, lifting some of the measures at this point in the pandemic, as Dawn also mentioned, um, we do continue, we're, we're taking that balanced approach and trying to strike that balance between what requirements remain necessary and which requirements can be lifted and, and balancing residents, uh, the safety of residents with their, their well-being and their, um, their mental health. Uh, so some of the measures that will remain in place though to continue to protect people that live and work in long-term care includes the ongoing infection prevention and control measures such as active screening before anyone enters a long-term care home. The testing that I spoke to, uh, there will be continued masking uh, for the, uh, in long-term care homes and the need to continue the personal protective equipment as well as any uh, cleaning of surfaces, all of that would, will continue um, at this time. Okay, I think that is our presentation. Um, I think we'll be opening it up for questions now. We have the Slido and I have my colleague Surgeon who is going to help facilitate and moderate the Q&A period for us. So can I turn it over to you, Surgeon? Thank you, Christine, you certainly can. Um, let me see the first question that we he have here on Slido. Um, can I dine with my father in his room with the door closed? Thanks, Serge, and I'll take that one. So, uh, no, at this time, uh, all visitors, all caregivers need to be masked um, um, all the time, even within the residence room. And so the dining of, of the visitors and caregivers would only be permitted if the home has a designated space uh, available for uh, caregivers and, and visitors to dine, um, and that would be uh, away from any residents. Thank you, Dawn. We'll go to the next question, which is when will the antigen and PCR testing stop on residents after social outings? Another one for me. So we're working closely with the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health to look at the uh, testing requirements. I'll also add in there the quarantine slash isolation requirements. And while I don't have an answer at this time for when that will be stopped, it is something that we are actively looking at um, and working with that group. Thanks, Dawn. I think the next question is also for you. Do the residents need to continue to wear masks at activities and with no more cohorting? Uh, hope it is not left up to each home. So the ministry has always recommended that, that residents wear masks as much as can be tolerated. There isn't actually a requirement from the ministry that residents be masked. I think it's uh, it's a defi definitely a best practice, and um, you know, you know, we 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 recognize that residents themselves are are in their homes, and so they may not be comfortable being masked all the time. Thank you, Dawn. Um, the next question um, is, I think, a very salient. I read that residents can have up to six possible uh, essential caregivers if they have been in the home prior to December 15, 2021. So two previously and four now, is that correct? So with the essential caregivers, um, prior to December, there is no limit on the number of caregivers that a resident may have. And in, in part of our response to the Omicron variant, uh, we did put in um, restrictions on the number of caregivers, but recognizing that some people may have already had more than what was already allocated or what we were now allocated, um, we didn't um, 
we didn't want to then make make uh, residents choose between their different caregivers. And so if somebody was already designated prior to December 15th, they could continue to be designated, even if it was more than the, what was um, within the, the uh, you know, the maximum number of caregivers. But having said that, if, if the person already had four care, caregivers prior to December 15th, that didn't mean they could add in an additional two caregivers. That meant that they, they would be at their limit of four caregivers. Thank you, Dawn, for uh, clarifying. Uh, a question for Christine, I think, do we need to continue with the face shields as well? I think that one's also a Dawn question. Apologies. <laughs> So the, the ministry has uh, does not have requirements on, on face shields for, for visitors or, or caregivers. Uh, the requirement is more around masking. So you should speak with your home if they're requiring face shields. Thank you, Don. Uh, Christine, this one is definitely for you. Homes can continue their own vaccination policies. Can they apply stricter policies than those of the ministry? Thank you, Surgeon. So, yeah, so homes can continue their own vaccination policies, and we have already seen uh, through media that a number of homes and home operators have uh, indeed decided to continue with their uh, requiring proof of vaccination for their staff. Um, going forward, the ministry itself will not have requirements on homes to have the to have vaccination policy. Um, vaccination requirements. So homes do have the ability to have their own uh, vaccination policies. They must comply with all applicable law, including the Long-Term Care Homes Act. We also strongly encourage homes to work with their family councils and their resident councils and to seek uh, legal advice and, uh, when they're you know, maintaining or implementing their vaccination policies. Thank you. Uh, a testing question now uh, regarding PSWs. Do they require to test prior to entry and wait for the test results? Thank you, Surgeon. So all staff um, are required to, to be tested through the surveillance testing requirements as I spoke about earlier. And so for those who are fully vaccinated, that's at least being tested twice a week. Um, staff are able, so they would be tested at the beginning of their shift and they are able to enter the home and, and get, you know, themselves organized for the start of their shift uh, while they wait for their test results. Um, so that might be a little different than what a visitor going into a home might experience where they have to wait until they get their negative test result before they can proceed into the home. Um, we do also uh, enable for caregivers uh, where this is possible in the home, we do enable caregivers to, uh, once they take their test, to proceed to the resident's room, um, provided they have all the proper PPE while they wait for their test result. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, definitely clarified that. Uh, one of the screening questions is contact with anyone who has traveled within the past 14 days. We have seen this sort of consistently. Is this still a factor given that travel advisories are no longer? So the, the, the screening question is uh, whether you travel in the past 14 days, but that doesn't actually determine whether you can enter the home. The determinant is whether or not you are required to be quarantined for the federal quarantine requirements. Um, and, and that's what makes a difference. Uh, I can tell you, um, and this this pretty much applies to all, all current re, uh, documents that um, we are using. There, there, there's a big review going on. We're working closely with uh, the Office of Chief Medical Officer of Health to look at everything that is currently in place and see what needs to be updated now that we are seeing um, the case counts and the outbreaks decreasing within long-term care homes and across the province overall. Thank you, Don. Uh, for Christine, what is the minimum requirement vaccination for essential caregivers? So from a government or ministry perspective, as I noted, there's no further, there's no more requirements on homes to uh, require vaccinations. It, it will be up to each home to implement their own vaccination policies. Um, however, we do strongly encourage everyone to get their up-to-date vaccinations, including their boosters, as that um, has proven to, you know, really um, help mitigate some of the impacts of outbreaks and especially severe outcomes for, for residents and family members. Thank you, Christine. Um, a question that I'm sure is uh, top of mind for many of us. Um, what about masking up 
after April 21st, will this continue within long-term care homes? So the province is uh, as a whole lifting masking restrictions on March 21st. And I can tell you that masking will continue in the long-term care homes. Dr. Moore announced on uh, last Wednesday that um, the directives issued by himself, so the Chief Medical Officer of Health, uh, will be ending on April 27th. Um, with the ending, the, the masking requirement sits under, it's called Directive 3, under his authority. Um, so we're not saying that masking will be ending on April 27th. We're, we are more actually under review with the Office of the Chief Medical Officer to Health to look at whether or not masking will still be required past that date. So definitely no decision made and something that we'll be uh, looking forward to communicating further on when there is more um, information available. Thank you, Don. Uh, what are the consequences for visitors that are not vaccinated and do not want to test? Thank you, Surgeon. Uh, so as I've noted, um, homes can have their own vaccination policies and that can apply to staff or can apply to caregivers and visitors. So I encourage you to reach out to your home to find out what the vaccination policy for your home is. Um, in terms of the testing, testing remains a requirement of the ministry and all visitors must be tested before they enter a long-term care home um, unless they have a, a negative test from the previous day and they can show proof of that negative test. But aside from that, um, all visitors do need to be tested before they enter a home or else they're not permitted entry into the home. Um, as I uh, mentioned during the presentation though, outdoor visits will no longer require the testing before a visit. So you could have an outdoor visit. Thank you very much. Um, are unvaccinated family caregivers without medical exemption, uh, exemptions allowed to visit today? So again, this goes back to the home's vaccination policy. So I encourage you to uh, reach out to your home to find out what your home's vaccination policy is with respect to family caregivers. Um, previously in our, in our policy, we did have exemptions for uh, caregivers who were visiting a resident who was receiving end of life care. Um, so if that is a situation that applies to you, um, there, uh, there is an opportunity there to um, connect with the home around your vaccination status if they do have a, a vaccination policy in place um, in order to visit your loved ones. But I encourage you to, to reach out to your home to find out what their vaccination policy will be going forward um, as they, they are the ones who can uh, determine uh, what their vaccination requirements will be for caregivers and staff and visitors. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. We've got uh, two questions that are similar and I believe we addressed them earlier, but we can clarify, is masking still required for visitors outdoors? Uh, yes, so masking is required. Anybody going into the homes required to wear a medical mask for outdoor uh, visits with uh, visitors. The visitor, it's not required to be a medical mask, but they are required to be masked. Thank you, Don. Um, are visitors allowed to bring in pets? This was allowed before the pandemic and the patients' residents loved it. Yes, the ministry doesn't put any restrictions on uh, people bringing in pets. I, I'd recommend that you speak with the, the home to see what their own pet policy is. Um, it, within the Long-Term Care Homes Act itself, there is a requirement that all pets uh, be fully, uh, have all of their vaccinations, essentially. Excellent, thank you, Don. Uh, before Omicron, essential caregivers were allowed to eat and drink in the resident's room. My husband is in a private room. Why would it be not acceptable now? Uh, this goes back to us taking um, an eased approach uh, into um, the, the measures that, that are um, being um, updated. Uh, so at this time, the, the recommendation from the Chief Medical Officer of Health is that uh, dining is a higher risk issue. Um, and so we uh, are still re requiring everybody to be back, uh, sorry, to be masked within the home at all times. Thank you. Um, as well, I believe we spoke to this earlier, but we are happy to clarify, do outside visitors need to be screened before meeting with the resident? 
Thank you, Sergeant, and happy to clarify. Uh, so visitors would still need to go through active screening, ensuring they pass the, the screening questions, but they, they don't need to do the rapid antigen testing for an outside, outdoor visit, but uh, they do still need to go through the screening process. Thank you. And I believe a question potentially for both of you, what do we do if we see protocols not being followed? So I'm assuming that means the, the sort of general direction from the province, the ministry. So one, we encourage you to speak with your home about uh, where you might have concerns with protocols that, or policies that you think are not being followed. And second, the ministry does have an action line, which we can uh, put a copy of the link in the chat. Um, and you can also uh, file a complaint with the ministry's action line and an inspector will go and, and ensure that uh, they'll, they'll inspect the home and ensure that policies are being followed. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, a question that I think uh, impacts a few based on the three thumbs up that we're seeing. Uh, we have to make appointments to see our loved one. I'm assuming this is within the home. This is difficult with my job. Is this a province-wide practice or perhaps is this something that is home specific? So um, this, is, this is likely home specific. And I, I think just recognizing too, um, you know, homes need to be, um, there's still a number of protocols in place and homes need to make sure that they, they have the operational ability to be welcoming all visitors into the home. I recognize that, you know, it may be challenging for some people uh, to be making appointments, but um, just, just asking for patients with, uh, with the homes themselves as um, you know, they, they need to make sure again, just with spacing, you know, physical distancing between groups is going to limit the number of people coming into the home it, itself. And, um, um, you know, appreciate not everything is, is completely back to normal, but definitely something um, that you should speak with the home about. Uh, thank you, Dawn. Uh, the perennial question, would the slides be available to share at our family council meeting? Yes, uh, we, Sam has these slides and is able to share them out. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I believe this we already addressed, but again, happy to clarify what is the testing requirement for residents when they return from day or overnight visits? So at this time, there's, there's been no update to the testing requirements. It really varies on the different um, scenarios and the, um, the amount of vaccinations that a resident has had. But in general, for those going for a day, um, day visit, they're, they're be going to be tested on day uh buy from that day visit and for those residents who go out on frequent day visits, uh, day absences, um, then we'll, and then it's testing two days a week and kind of consistent testing since they're out of the home frequently. Thank you. Uh, Christine, one for you. What is the rationale for discontinuing the requirement for staff to have vaccination? Thank you, Surgeon. Uh, so an, appoint, an important point of clarity here is this isn't the, the Ministry of the Government saying um, you must no longer have uh, require, vaccination requirements for staff. Um, it really is at, at this point in the pandemic, the, the government moving towards a direction of not um, having this broad mandate for all organizations and instead leaving it up to organizations to develop the policies that work best for their home and for their, their residents and and the families in the community. Um, so it really is this shift from this government kind of mandate to supporting homes with their own vaccination policies um, that they wanna put in place based on their kind of unique circumstances. Thank you. Uh, a question that now gets into like, some of the sort of mechanics of the interaction with residents. So if somebody were to pick up their mom, so they're driving up for a social outing, do they need a rapid test? So the, the test would be required if the person is intending to enter the long-term care home. They would need a test if, if their mom is waiting for them outside for when, when they pick them up, then the person would not need to be uh, rapid tested. So the rapid test is uh, upon entry into the home. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, a question I think uh, for both, uh, why with each ministry directive, the residents and families are never asked for feedback on how these directives will impact uh, the residents? Uh, so so a really good question that I'm happy to answer, Surgeon. Um, so, you know, recognizing that there's approximately 70,000 uh, residents and 
uh, many, many more loved ones. Uh, we, we do have our response and recovery advisory committee that has been uh, instrumental in providing feedback as, as we have been making uh, changes and updates throughout the, the, the last year of the pandemic. So the representatives for the families on that committee is actually Sam Peck herself uh, as, uh, as her position in the FCO. For residents, it's Steve Tripp who, who joins us from the um, o OR, uh, Ontario Association of Residents Councils to, to really make sure that we do have the residents and the family's voice um, at the table and in providing us their feedback. Thank you, Don. Uh, will the ministry be working on alternatives to isolation going forward? Lockdowns have resulted in much sadness for residents and families. So absolutely, we're, we're working closely again with the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. The, uh, the other point um, with regards to when outbreaks happen um, in isolation um, and testing requirements is that the public health units play a big role in that as well. Uh, when an outbreak happens, it's really the public health unit that comes in um, and makes decisions on how that outbreak will be handled, who needs to be tested, who needs to be isolated. Um, and so definitely working on that. that that's, that's one because we have the 34 PHUs where we're really trying to get consistency across the province um, as much as possible, but recognizing that there may be regional variants, especially because, um, you know, each each area of the province uh, might have um, might have their Omnicrom or just their COVID situation looking a little bit different. Thank you. Uh, a question that I'm sure is top of mind for many residents, are children under five allowed in homes? And if yes, what are the testing requirements for them? Thank you, Surgeon. So children under the age of five are now uh, permitted to enter a long-term care home. So we did have a temporary measure in place uh, due to Omicron, which uh, restricted all visitors to, to only those who were, well, once we, we had a restriction that general visitors weren't permitted for a period of time. And then once they were, they needed to be uh, vaccinated. Um, and that did limit those who were under the age of five from um, entering long-term care homes because they were not yet eligible for uh, vaccination. Um, so going forward, even though homes can introduce their own vaccination policies, we have specifically put in our ministry guidance that those policies are not to apply to children under the age of five, recognizing that they're not yet eligible uh, for vaccination. Um, having said that, they are subject to the testing requirements, so they would need to be tested prior to entry. Um, that doesn't apply, though, for um, infants under the age of one. Um, they would not need to be tested, but um, anyone above the age of one who's entering a long-term care home does need to be tested upon entry. Excellent. Thank you, Christine. Um, a bit of a leading question, sort of anticipating uh, the future here. Europe, in some places, is seeing an increase in the rate of COVID again. What measures are anticipated here in Ontario? So, uh, again, we're working closely with the Office of Chief Medical Officer of Health, and they are very um, on top of what's happening around the world with, it, with regards to uh, COVID including the different variants out there. As I, I know, the, the, the new variant is similar to, to Omicron, but, but not identical. Um, so watching closely and just, you know, looking at if measures need to be put in place. But at this time, as you can see, we're actually uh, easing of the measures. And so um, nothing anticipated here at, that, at this time, but we will definitely um, make sure that everybody's aware if additional measures do need to be put in place. Thank you, Don. Uh, the next question is about sort of uh, travel repercussions. How many days does a caregiver that has been away from Canada have to wait before they can visit his or her loved ones at the long-term care home? Thanks, Surgeon. So th this goes along with the screening question. And again, it's, it's not about the, the number of days away it's, or, or how long you've been back. It's, it's more about whether or not you need to be um, quarantining per the federal requirements. And so if you don't need to be in quarantine per the federal requirements, there's no restriction on entering the home uh, for that purpose. Excellent, thank you. Uh, can essential caregivers and or PSWs now work within more than one area or section of a home? Uh, also a question regarding staff working on multiple floors or between homes. So one update we haven't made yet is the staff uh, cohorting that, that is still a, a be put in place. There is a little caveat with that as every home is different. 
Um, and so in some homes, it's not possible for the staff to be uh, cohorted and um, just recognizing to, uh, especially during Omicron, there was a significant staffing shortages in some homes, as many staff were, were um, home uh, um, with Omicron or because they had been in close contact with somebody with Omicron. And so um, it, it really comes down to just what's operationally feasible and making sure that residents are, are receiving the best care possible, um, but definitely um, sh should be cohorting as much as possible for the staff. Excellent, thank you, Don. Uh, as an essential caregiver, I have been feeding my dad in his uh, in his room since last year. Our group dining, after group dining, resumes in the dining room. Can I feed him there? Uh, yes, and so as, as we mentioned in the presentation, um, uh, visitors, caregivers are are welcome to join in the the dining room or in social group activities, uh, especially if you're going to be providing uh, assistance with eating. Thank you, Don. Uh, essential caregivers or visitors that come in every day, why do they need to be tested every day as they are in our home versus staff PSWs getting tested every other day? Thank you, Surgeon. So what the, uh, the minister's directive requires is, uh, so staff and caregivers follow the same requirements. They're to be tested at a minimum two times per week if they're fully vaccinated. Uh, visitors are tested um, upon entry every time they enter, unless they can provide proof of a negative test from the day prior. Um, what I will say, what I will add, which I don't think I mentioned earlier, is that homes uh, can make the decision to go above and beyond the minimum requirement of two times per week, per week. And in fact, we do know there are a number of homes that have been testing staff and caregivers on a more frequent basis. Um, yeah, so really uh, encourage you to speak to the home in terms of their specific policies, but the minimum requirements under the minister's directive is for caregivers and staff to be tested at least twice a week and visitors, it's a prior to each visit. Excellent, thank you. Uh, what are the specific testing protocols for inspectors with statutory rights of entry in their specific ministries? This is a bit, um, it encompasses many other ministries, not just MLTC. So I can speak to the MLTC one uh, specifically. Uh, so we do have uh, vaccination and testing requirements for inspectors who are going into long-term care homes and they do need to be tested at the same frequency as uh, staff or caregivers. Um, so they have uh, alignment there in terms of the testing and they report to their managers. Um, they do not do the testing on site at a long-term care home. They uh, do it as part of their employment arrangement um, and they're accountable to their managers for that testing. Um, inspectors are also required to be fully vaccinated. I know um, for a Ministry of Labor inspectors, they also have requirements for their inspectors who are going into long-term care homes to, to be vaccinated. So they're only sending those inspectors who are fully vaccinated into long-term care homes. Um, so those are some of the requirements there for, for inspectors. Thank you, Christine. Um, what is the ministry's rationale behind essentially creating a patchwork of vaccination uh, messaging? You've spoken to this previously uh, and also noting that the, at the attendee, call attendee has received many questions about the rationale of removing provincial directive and allowing the homes to implement their own vaccination policies. Thank you, Sergeant. I, I completely appreciate um, like where this question is coming from and the concern that is being raised here. Um, really, this is a, a government uh, decision to move away from the strict provincial mandates and instead uh, enabling organizations to make the decisions that are best for them. Um, and this aligns with decisions that are being made in other sectors, such as retirement homes and other healthcare settings like hospitals. So it's really this, uh, you know, a consistent uh, direction across government around removing these uh, broader uh, mandates now that we're at this stage in the pandemic and moving towards more the organizations and enabling organizations to make uh, policies that work best uh, for them given their unique circumstances. Thank you, Christine. Uh, do we have any statistics for LTC outbreaks in Ontario related to Omicron? So for example, the time period of December to present day. Um, I don't have that information at my fingertips to, to be able to to, to share that out. I can tell you we've, we've been collecting data through 
throughout uh, the pandemic, and there's actually two different data sources, but the, the, the one we watch most closely is the home reported data. Um, we saw, we saw, um, we went from having um, prior to Omicron, you know, two, three homes in outbreak to very quickly watching uh, the numbers rise. Our peak uh, for the Omicron pandemic uh, in the long-term care sector was the end of January, uh, January 29th to be exact on that, where we had 371 of our 626 homes in outbreak at the same time. Um, and with that, with residents, we were looking at um, in the 4,000 range of residents having uh, COVID-19 and between two and 3,000 staff also have, uh, having COVID-19, having tested positive. Uh, the good news is uh, for this wave, um, even though we had the high numbers, we were actually seeing a very high percentage of uh, residents specifically who were uh, asymptomatic, uh, between 50 and 60% of residents consistently asymptomatic, um, and then very much reporting that those who did have symptoms for the most part had mild symptoms from COVID-19. Uh, but this isn't to take away from the fact that there were still some residents who had severe outcomes from COVID-19 as well. Thank you, Dawn. Um, not sure if our ACMO colleagues, uh, that's the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health are on the line, uh, but a question about fourth shots or second boosters, when would they be available for essential caregivers? Yes, I don't have a specific answer to this question. What I can say is that the fourth doses are currently only um, available for, for residents in long-term care homes and retirement homes and similar congregate settings, as well as for those who are severely immunocompromised. Um, and currently they're not available for the, the broader population, example, for staff or caregivers. Um, that the, currently there is like the third dose that, that is available for, for everyone. So if you have already received your third dose, uh, thank you. And um, I think that you're doing the, the right thing to protect yourself and your loved ones in terms of maximizing your, your immunity and your protection with the vaccines that are available. Absolutely, thank you, Christine. Uh, we will clarify this, uh, the difference between dining, dining in patient's private room versus a room that is designated. Absolutely. So, uh, so, uh, so dining for visitor dining in the patient room that that's not allowed the, the visitor needs to be uh, masked at all times. A room that is designated would be where the home has set aside a specific space that is a um, away from any residence where the um, the visitor, the caregiver would be be able to to eat or 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 drink. And so, um, really, you'll you'll need to work with your home to see what what uh, that space would be and what's available to you. Thank you, Don. Uh, now, a clarifying question uh, that I think builds on what the ministry has been saying about the expectation to work with the resident councils and family councils within each home. But can homes implement policies above the directives without consulting with the family council of their home before implementation? The act says that they are expected to. I'm happy to answer this one, unless Sam, you wanted to. Uh, maybe I'll start, and then Dawn, you can you can add too. Just I don't want to uh, give anything uh, misinformation. So I'm Absolutely. looking. At double checking the guidance document um, and so what the document says is that in any case where homes are exceeding the requirements um, set out by the ministry uh, directives and orders it is expected the home will consult with both the resident and family councils and also the local public health unit so if there's any but if there's any conflict between um, decisions that the home might make then the, the the legislation directive or other order prevails. What we've seen that's been really effective is when the, the home comes to the family or residence council and um, gives them a draft of what they're looking to implement um, and explaining the rationale behind it. So it is expected that the home will consult uh, what that consultation looks like will differ from home to home, but where it's been successful is where the home provides um, the, the outline of the approach, the rationale, and then the implementation, because often the, the tricky bit is in implementing any decision so that families and residents understand it and can abide by it. Uh, Dawn, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that. 
Uh, that was great, Sam, probably better than I could have provided. I will just add on that there's sometimes that it's not the home implementing additional policies. It may also be the public health unit um, implementing the additional policies, but we are definitely uh, recommending and really encouraging homes as much as possible to be working with the family councils and the resident councils to make sure that that voice is heard as it, it really is such an important voice. And back to my, kind of my opening remarks as well, just um, recognizing that everybody has different views on how things um, um, should be with with um, the returning to no to normalcy within long term care homes and and throughout the provinces as well and so um, you, you know well one individual may feel that um, a measure shouldn't be in place and I think we even see it here with the questions others really feel like that's gone too far and, and should continue to be in place and so um, it 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 it's it's a balancing act not just for the ministry but also for the homes as well. Thank you, Don. Uh, a question regarding socialization of residents within be uh, within a home. Can residents socialize with one another? Can community rooms uh, be opened up? Uh, so absolutely, we are encouraging as much uh, socialization between residents as possible. And as I mentioned, not just within the units, but across units or across floors. Um, um, so I, I, you know, the community room being opened up, I don't know what that is specifically and recommend that, that you speak to your home as the ministry has never put in place the requirement to close down any specific rooms. Thank you. Um, if residents are allowed to go on day and overnight trips, likely potentially meeting family without masking, why are visitors mandated to mask in the room in the home? So, you know, the, there's a layered uh, measures to public health um, and, you know, recognizing that within a home, there's uh, multiple people that are sharing a place all living together. Um, and this really just speaks to, um, you know, again, back to that the residents within the long term care, we're trying to prevent the spread of COVID-19, um, of course, with the testing. Um, we're also trying to prevent the entering of COVID-19 into the homes. And so masking is an excellent public health measure and we are continuing to keep it in place. And even when um, residents are outside of, um, outside of the home, you know, there is the recommendation that where possible, continuing to wear a mask, um, you know, not being around on uh, people who are not vaccinated, you know, not a requirement, but definitely something that's still recommended. Thank you. Uh, let's clarify the testing bit uh, again. Are visitors being tested before visiting their loved ones in the building? Yeah, and I might um, combine this one with the next question as well, which is also around whether staff need to be tested before entering uh, the unit. Uh, so the, the requirements for testing of visitors are that they be tested before they enter into the home and they have to receive their test results before they can visit with their loved one. Uh, so that's addressing the, the visitor piece. And then for staff and caregivers, so for staff, they are to be tested at the start of their shift. They can proceed into the home and into the unit um, wearing the appropriate PPE. Uh, while they're waiting for their test result, And similarly, caregivers, they are tested upon entry um, at the frequency, the at least two times per week. Um, and they can proceed to the residence room uh, provided they're wearing the appropriate PPE as well. Thank you. Uh, what type of recreational activities can residents attend? Can residents be encouraged to socialize with each other? They remain isolated in rooms mostly. Um, so I think this is one where if you're finding that residents are being isolated in their rooms, that you should be speaking with the home about that. As, as we've talked about today, there's there's no restrictions from the ministry on the residents uh, being part of a social activities. And we are definitely encouraging the homes that um, to allow as much uh, socializing um, as, as we can between residents. Uh, we did just for awareness, hold a resident uh, uh, a webinar with the long term care homes on Friday of last week to talk about these additional easing of measures. And that was one of the messages that we were um, sure to strongly encourage. Um, so again, recommend speaking with your home if, if, if the residents are remaining isolated when you feel like they should not be. Thank you. 
Patient, this is probably a question for colleagues at the Office of Chief Medical Officer of Health, but can children visitors have cheek swabs instead of a nasal swab? Um, one is definitely easier on the child than the other. Uh, having a child myself, I can attest to this. <laughs> uh, the PCR tests in particular have been very challenging. Um, so most of the rapid tests that we have in Ontario have been tested using the nasal swab. Um, however, having said that, recent advice from the science advisory table and supported by our, the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health is that the swabs um, for the Omicron variant are actually uh, appear to be more effective if you do a combined oral, so kind of like cheek swab and on the tongue and in the nose. Um, so kind of a combined approach there. Um, so there is the opportunity for a bit of a combined approach, um, but uh, you know, most of the, the rapid antigen tests that we have in Ontario are um, were tested in terms of their effectiveness based on the nasal swab, swab approach. I completely appreciate this question though, because I do know how, how challenging it is for kids to, to have the nasal swabs. Absolutely. Uh, clarifying whether visitors assisting in the dining hall need to physically distance. Uh, so no, um, as I mentioned before, physical distancing in the dining hall needs to be, be between the tables, not at the tables themselves. And um, especially if somebody is uh, assisting a, a resident, I, I don't think it'd be possible to physically distance from the resident. Thank you. Uh, each home has their own testing policy. It seems this is a question. Ours keeps testing even if previously infected. Thank you, Surgeon. Uh, so the, the requirements in the minister's directive, um, as I mentioned, were previously updated to increase the uh, that time period from infection from 30 days to 90 days. Um, so that is the minimum requirement that homes need to follow. As we have kind of noted throughout the presentation and Q&A session, there are opportunities for homes to go above and beyond that um, and encourage them to speak to their local public health unit um, around uh, this in particular, especially um, one of the challenges though we had with the Omicron wave is that not everyone received a confirmed um, test result confirming that they were in fact infected with COVID-19. So that period of time only applies if um, there's a confirmed PCR test um, validating that they were previously infected with COVID-19. So uh, that might be um, one of the things that might be happening there as well. Thank you, Christine. And on the heels of that, are homes permitted to have their staff self-test at home prior to coming in for their shift? In terms of the uh, testing at home, so currently uh, this is not something that the ministry permits. Um, it is something that we're actively looking into, however. Um, we do know there are other sectors that do have their staff self-test at home before coming in, so that is something that's under active consideration right now. Okay, thank you very much, Christine and Don and Sam. Uh, looking at the clock, it is 11.29, uh, so I will pass it over to Sam for concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you to the folks who attended and to uh, all of the our guest speakers from the ministry. So Dawn, Christine, Surgeon, Aaron, and Caitlin, thank you very much for joining us this morning. There have been a lot of questions that have come in over the last hour that we've spent together, um, more than we could possibly uh, get to in this uh, seemingly short time. Um, so we did our best to work through the high volume of questions received uh, and group them to answer as many as possible. Uh, please note that if you have any other questions, questions that weren't, we didn't have time to address, there's the email address there that you can reach the pandemic response team. So it's MLTC, pandemic response at Ontario.ca. And please note that um, the slides and recording of today's session uh, will be available on the Family Council's Ontario website and e-bulletin. It'll be in next week's issue, but it'll likely be up on our website before then. So please keep an eye there. If you don't already receive our e-bulletin, you can go to FCO, so for Family Councils Ontario, .ngo, and follow the link to sign up.
So once again, just a big thank you to the over 300 people, uh, I think at one point over 400 that joined us today, as well as the guest speakers from the ministry. So again, I'm Sam Peck, the Executive Director of Family Councils Ontario, and it has been my pleasure to spend the last hour with you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Bye.